On behalf of Ford Fund, the philanthropic arm of Ford Motor Company, thank you for joining us as we honor and recognize the important role of African Americans in our nation's history. For more than a century, Ford has put the world on wheels, fostered innovation, and stepped up in times of need. From our historic $5 a day wage, regardless of race, to our contributions to the war effort during World War II, to the production of urgently needed medical equipment and PPE supplies to help combat the coronavirus pandemic, we are striving to build a better world for everyone, every day. That is why we are proud to partner with the National Archives Foundation and the National Archives and Records Administration to connect, educate, and inspire Americans to celebrate our shared history. We are especially pleased to support the Archives Fund for Rights and Justice and Black History Month programming, which brings known and lesser known stories of people of color to citizens across the nation and around the world, including how they have shaped our country's history and are laying a foundation for the future. We hope you are enlightened, encouraged, and inspired to share what you learn. For more information on Ford Fund's broader community investments, visit fordfund.org or follow us on social media. Thank you. Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion on the Black Family Representation, Identity, and Diversity. We're presenting this program in partnership with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and we thank them for their support. The theme of tonight's program, The Black Family, is also the theme of this year's Black History Month. Family is the core unit of our society, and those seeking family history documentation compose the single largest group of researchers here at the National Archives. Indeed, the greatest boost to genealogical research here was the publication of Alex Haley's Roots and the subsequent miniseries in the 1970s. Family research was no longer only for the elites. It was something we could all dive into. We could all fill out our family stories and share them across the generations. Now it's my pleasure to welcome our panel and begin our discussion of the family as the foundation of African American life and history. Our moderator is Ida E. Jones, University Archivist at Morgan State University, and our panelists are Allison Parker, author of Unceasing Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell, Darius Young, author of Robert R. Church, Jr. and the African American Political Struggle, John Whittington Franklin and Karen Roberts Franklin, managing members of Franklin Global LLC, and Barbara Spencer Dunn, Vice President for Membership and Contributor and member of the Black History 365 Professional Development Team for the Association of the Study of African American Life and History. Thank you for joining us today. Good evening, and thank you, Dr. Ferriero, for the warm welcome. As the moderator, I want to share a statement so we can contextualize our conversation. The Black family in America is one of the oldest institutions created by formerly enslaved Africans. Chattel enslavement complicated the formation of nuclear families while spawning kinship networks to provide communal ties. In the narrative of, Frederick, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, he wrote, my mother's name was Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parentage. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I knew my, her as my mother. Douglas chronicled his life in two separate biographies during the course of his lifetime, from enslavement to self-emancipation. Throughout his life, he became a husband, father, abolitionist, feminist, ambassador, and statesman. Clearly, his life served as a prism through which the light of the black family's representation, identity, and diversity is refracted. Tonight, using the life of Douglas as a prism, we will explore select aspects of black family, from enslavement to politics with the church siblings, to marriage and familial legacy with the Roberts and Franklin Union, to researching an ancestral plantation in Cushing, Texas. 
All of these aspects of black family life were expressed by Douglas in his autobiographies. Also, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, utilized Douglas as a prism, bringing all Americans into consciousness of black history by selecting February for Negro History Week in 1926. Book ended by the birth dates of Abraham Lincoln on February 12th and Frederick Douglass on February 14th, Douglas himself stated, genealogical trees did not flourish among the slaves. However, today, we as their descendants continue to seek understanding and celebration of how familial ties are organisms expanding and collapsing in each generation. In brief, the two church siblings represent a family from Memphis, Tennessee, and they worked independently and collaboratively at times to enrich the political voice of African Americans in bipartisan politics. Two recent biographies recover the personal and public lives of Mary Church Terrell and her younger brother, Robert R. Church, Jr. These siblings represented a blended family born in enslavement and during Reconstruction. They represented the aspirations of African Americans seeking voice and citizenship in national, local, politics, government, and society. The idea of power couples lends itself to being highly visible and power broken in select circles. However, in the African American community, Power couples are broadly defined through partnerships that unite legacy and vision. The identity of the Franklin Roberts family is a living legacy of a power couple formed from the educated elite. Their ancestry in medical, legal, and academic professions spans a greater part of the 20th century. Inspired by their ancestors, the Franklin Roberts family demonstrates aspects of how identity is crafted, curated, and transferred throughout the community. With regards to plantation life, harvesting rice, cotton, indigo, or wheat were all cultivated by black hands. The enslavement period morphed according to its staple produce, region of the country, and proximity to port cities. Barbara Spencer Dunn embodies this aspect of diversity through sharing her ancestral roots from Cushing, Texas, on the Monte Verde plantation. This story recognizes how the Dunn family survived. Their genealogical research sheds light on how plantation life was experienced differently in eastern Texas. In essence, the black family continues to refract the light of history, inclusion, patriotism, heritage, travail, and triumph. Tonight's discussion will present a cursory introduction to aspects of representation, identity, and diversity. For additional information and for further programming, please visit ASALH.org, as well as the National Park Service's Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, and as you heard from our archivist United States, NARA.org. Thank you and enjoy. I would like to introduce our panelists once again for your discussion. There are three groups and they're going to be three topics. So our first con conversants will be Allison Parker, Chair, Department of History at the University of Delaware, author of Unceasing Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell, followed by Darius Young, Associate Professor of History at FAMU in Florida, who is the author of Robert R. Church, Jr. and The African American Political Struggle. I'll introduce the next set after they finish. Thank you and enjoy. Allison? Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm going to try to share my screen now. Uh, can you see it? Yes, okay. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this and I'm going to give you a brief discussion of uh, Mary or Molly Church's family history and its connection to her activism. Mary or Molly Church's father was Robert Reed Church. And he was born to an enslaved woman, Emmeline, whose enslaver, Dr. Burton, allowed his friend, another white man, the steamboat captain, Charles B. Church, free and open access to her. Emmeline gave birth to Robert Reed Church in 1839. After she died at age 30, the Burton family sold 12-year-old Robert to his biological father. Decades later, Burton's daughter offered uh, additional details to Robert about how and why he was sold. Captain Church, she claimed, had promised Emmeline he would buy you and emancipate you and put you in school in Cincinnati. But Robert's father and slaver never followed through on his 1851 promise to the dying Emmeline, who had hoped against hope that her son would become a free and literate young man. Later, during the Civil War, the still enslaved Robert Church courted Louisa Ayers, the enslaved daughter of a white Memphis attorney, 
T.S. Ayers. Robert and Louisa wed in 1862 in a ceremony attended by both of their white enslaver fathers who served as the witnesses. Their daughter, Molly Church, was enslaved in the middle of the civil was born enslaved in the middle of the Civil War in 1863 in Memphis, Tennessee. I emphasize all of this because some members of Robert Church's family later tried to put as much distance as possible between themselves and the notion that their revered patriarch had been a slave. In contrast, as a civil rights activist, Molly Church Terrell always drew on her family history to critique White's nostalgia for the system of enslavement, a nostalgia that never acknowledged the harm done to enslaved families who were separated, humiliated, and treated as less than fully human. When her father, Robert Church, was an adult, he learned more of his family history from letters he received from the Burton family, who described how they had sold his grandmother, Lucy, away from her child, Emmeline, as a simple economic calculus. In the changing scenes of commercial life, grandfather was forced to send 100 Negroes at one time from Virginia to Mississippi to pay a debt. Among the number was your grandmother, Lucy. She was bought by a very rich planter in Mississippi who gave her the same liberty of action our family had. Never in life was she treated as a slave. This event separated your mother and grandmother. Without empathy or irony, the letter writer could not see that this permanent forced separation was a searing illustration of the power of the institution of enslavement. Robert Church shared this 1901 letter with his daughter, Molly, who was by then a mother herself. She was haunted by this matter of fact recounting and in public speeches pointed to her family's history to condemn white Southerners for their hypocritical nostalgia. When slavery is discussed and somebody rhapsodizes upon the goodness and kindness of masters and mistresses toward their slaves, it is hard for me to conceal my disgust. The anguish of one slave mother from whom her baby was snatched away outweighs all the kindnesses and goodness which were occasionally shown a favored slave. In speeches to white audiences, she condemned white men for raping and assaulting vulnerable black women under their control. For instance, the White National Purity Association invited Terrell to give a talk on purity and the Negro in 1905, in which she highlighted the vulnerability of black women to rape by white men. She charged that even in the 20th century, Colored women have been regarded as the rightful prey of every white man, and they have been protected from the wiles and lechery of their destroyers, neither by public sentiment nor by law. In spite of having spent her first two years enslaved, Molly Church grew up in a privileged household. She, lear she learned to use her class privilege, education, light skin color, and cross-class and cross-race connections in tactical ways to work on a wide range of social justice and civil rights campaigns. Thank you. All right, thank you, Allison, and um, I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. I want to thank uh, Ida again for inviting me um, to participate in this conversation, and I know we have a limited amount of time, so I will um, introduce you all to my uh, the person that I wrote about, Robert Church Jr. and the African American political struggle. Uh, which was published a couple years ago in the University Press of Florida, which really looks at uh, Robert Church and his uh, contributions to organizing the black vote in the first half of the 20th century by the 1920s. Uh, Church is probably the most influential black Republican um, of his era. Again, the son of Robert Reed Sr., who is a very influential real estate magnate, businessman, um, arguably the richest uh, black man in the South during during his uh, the height of his his um, wealth, right? And so we talk about those issues, but today I want to talk about um, really his family and um, beginning with his second marriage um, to Anna Wright. Anna Wright over here to your right um, is a phenomenal story as well. Anna uh, was born free. 
Her father was a Quaker abolitionist in Pennsylvania who would later move to Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, she attended um, Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and also uh, went to school at Oberlin as well to study music. Um, this marriage produced two children, Robert Jr. sitting down and his baby sister, Annette, uh, both of whom also followed in their big sister's footsteps, Molly, and attended Oberlin. Uh, Robert from there would go on to continue his studies for a year in New York at the uh, Packard School of Business, uh, really with the intention of coming back to run his father's company and in, in particular uh, the bank that his father owned. Um, in the book, I kind of talk about the child-rearing strategies of Robert Sr. and Anna, that even though they were born into this privilege, um, even though they had access that most African Americans did not have during the height of Jim Crow, um, very much so they were deliberate in the way that they approached, uh, and, and Molly talks about this a lot too, Allison, in terms of how they were concealed really from the realities of racism. Um, instead of riding in uh, second class coaches or in the black culture with trains, father would purchase an entire car. Um, they uh, went to these private schools up north and things of that nature um, with the intention of grooming activists who, once they became came of age, that they would confront racism when it was when they were met with it. Right. Um, Robert marries. Um, a school teacher from Washington, D.C., by the name of Sarah, also known as Sally Parati Church, born Sarah Parati Johnson. Um, she, too, comes from some privilege, um, went to the minor school in um, D.C., which is now UDC, um, also is a graduate of the famed M Street Colored High School. And as they were courting each other in 1909, 1910, um, Molly would often write Robert because um, Sarah would go would eventually come back to M Street and serve as a teacher, and Mary would kind of write him and keep him up to date with some of the things that she was doing and say hi for and things of that nature. Um, until she until they got married, um, Francis Grimke married them in this elaborate ceremony in, in D.C. and then they would eventually come back to Memphis. Um, their daughter, Sarah Roberta Church, named after both their parents, uh, too, would have a very influential career in politics in the 1950s and um, beyond. Um, a very significant figure as well in, in Memphis and Tennessee. Um, when you're going through the church records, you know, she was very protective of her parents' legacy and uh, did everything. She would confront historians oftentimes if they said anything disparaging about um, her father. One of my mentors at Memphis uh, knew her very well, and um, I was very pleased to have access to those records when I was a student at University of Memphis. This was the church family house on Lauderdale Street. Um, there were other prominent black families who lived along that street. Um, I wanted to show that house not only because of how significant it is when we think about African Americans being able to achieve that amount of wealth to purchase a house, house of that scale, but to also talk about um, why it's important for us to continue to write these books and to tell these stories, uh, because that church, uh, the church's house no longer exists, as does none of the houses uh, of the black, quote unquote, black elite in Memphis. It was uh, destroyed a year after Robert Church Jr. passed away by a person by the name of uh, Edward Hull Crump, Boss Crump in Memphis. Um, he decided to light that house on fire in, in order to test the uh, new fire nozzles that the fire department received. So um, that legacy is really a race in the city, even though there are other markers of things um, available. So I'll go ahead and stop here and I hope to have more conversations about Church and his um, contributions to the Black Freedom Struggle during his era in the early 1920s uh, and 1930s. Thank you. Thank you, Darius. Our next group will be Karen Roberts Franklin 
and John Whittington Franklin of the Franklin Global LLC, both managing members. Karen? Thank you. Good evening. Pictured here are my paternal grandparents, James Knox Roberts and Sally Jane Dangerfield Roberts, both born in Hume, Virginia in 1873 and 1878, respectively. They married in 1901 and moved to Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, where he was a mule driver in a coal mine and she was a homemaker. Next slide, please. My father, James Elvin Roberts, born on July 27, 1903, seen here at the upper right-hand corner on his Hearst High School football team, was the eldest of eight children. It was expected that he would become the foreman in the coal mines, but he wanted to attend college. Next slide, please. Following his high school graduation, he moved to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University, <clears throat> where he obtained his B.S. in 1931 and his M.S. in zoology in 1933. Next slide, please. My father is pictured here having received his M.D. in 1937. He specialized in obstetrics and gynecology. Next slide, please. Here, he is after establishing his private practice near Howard University. His brothers followed him to DC and he established the Empire Laundry, Diaper and Linen Service to employ them. Next slide, please. My mother's family is from South Carolina. My mother, Sylvester Authorine Viola Roach's mother, Hattie Viola Williams, is pictured here in the center of the second row with her siblings and grandparents, circa 1900. Next slide, please. My mother pictured here on the left, she's about, she's around six years old, with her cousin Edna, came to Washington, D.C. to finish high school at Cardoza Business High School in 1927. She returned to Columbia, South Carolina to attend Benedict College her parents, alma mater. Next slide, please. She returns to DC to work in her aunt and uncle's store in Arlington, Virginia. She subsequently works as an executive secretary in the Department of Army of World War II. Next slide, please. She met my father in the 1940s. This photo of them dancing in the early 1950s was probably taken at Chi Delta Mu Medical Fraternity's Christmas dinner dance. Next slide, please. And this last image, they moved to Silver Spring, Maryland in April 1959, five years after their marriage, breaking the color barrier. Thank you. My father arrives in, in my father's family arrives in Indian territory in the 1830s as slaves to Chickasaw Indians. Born in 1820, David Burney, owned by the Burney family, frees himself and enlists in the Union Army as David Franklin. My grandfather, Buck Colbert Franklin, born in 1879, like his father is a rancher and black cowboy. He goes to Roger Williams University, a black Baptist school in Nashville, where he meets Molly Lee Parker, my grandmother-to-be. Here he is in 1899 and 1901. These photographs are taken in the Calvert Brothers studio in Nashville. While they're in college, petroleum and natural gas are discovered and Tulsa becomes the oil capital of the world. They marry in 1903, and he and my grandmother are farmers and teachers. Grandpa apprentices with other black lawyers in Ardmore, Oklahoma, as admitted to the bar in December 1907, one month after statehood. The next image, please. On February 20th, exactly 100 years ago, 
1921, he moves to Tulsa to establish a law firm with I.H. Spears, leaving his wife and two youngest children in Rentersville. May 31st to June 1st, 1921, the black community of Greenwood is destroyed in the Tulsa race massacre. Pictured here on June 6th, he on the right and his law partner, I.H. Spears, on the left, received their clients in a Red Cross tent with their temporary secretary, Effie Thompson, and my grandfather's college roommate. Next slide, please. My grandparents are not reunited until 1925 when Greenwood is still rebuilding. In the next slide, here is my grandfather. Here's my father on the left with his brother, B.C. Franklin Jr. in the early 1940s. The next slide, please. My mother is from Goldsboro, North Carolina, pictured here with her brother before 1920. And in the next image, with her sister, Bertha. The next slide, please. Dad's brother goes to Fisk before him, and my mother's sister follows her to Fisk. Here are my parents with my maternal grandmother at their college graduation in 1935. Next slide, please. Dad goes on to grad school at Harvard and mom to library school at Hampton. They marry in 1940 in Goldsboro. Their first jobs are in North Carolina, dad at St. Aug, St. Augustine's College. You see them there in the middle of the front row. Before moving to North Carolina College for Negroes in 1943, where he teaches history and mom is the law librarian. Next and last image, please. They moved to Washington in 1947, just as From Slavery to Freedom is being published. Dad is a professor at Howard and mom in the next image is a librarian in the last image, is a librarian in the Prince George's and DC public schools. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, John. Our last panelist before discussion is Barbara Spencer Dunn. She is currently the Vice President of Membership of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History and a contributor and member of the Black History 365 Professional Development Team. Ms. Dunn? Mrs. Dunn. Good evening. Every child should have a village. And my village was my community. I now understand the commitment my parents had to community was in their DNA. Their village was their community. So they grew up at a time right after slavery in the early 1900s. And so the pictures that you will see flowing behind me are just family photos that depict my family. Recently in 2018, my family joined many family members from around the country at a celebration when the state of Texas erected a monument to my family, those who were enslaved on the Monte Verde Plantation in Russ County, Texas. They were survivors, and that is why I know that we are survivors. I think a lot about the narrative of Frederick Douglass when he asked the profound question, why am I a slave? I'm going to answer that question today for the sake of this conversation because there is a root cause for slavery. The root cause is greed that created a system of slavery, and that system of slavery has a clear, harsh, brutal logic behind its roots that created a false racial construct that empowered an entire culture to, of people to brutalize and inflict crimes against the other culture. This brutalization was against the humanity of this culture that still exists today. So what we have to do is the truth must be told. So what did my family do? That takes me back to Monte Verde. Even in the midst of slavery, they found freedom in enslavement because they were free in their minds. They were able to grow their own crops and they kept the money when they sold the crops. So they had money when slavery ended. They worked to work together in that community. And when slavery ended in 1865, my great-grandfather, Green Lewis, 
actually, and his wife, Phoebe, donated the land that started the first school and church in that community. And what is very empowering to me is that my family, when they were told they needed surnames, they did not take the surnames of the slave owners. They did an African tradition, which says to me, they held strong to their African traditions, even in the midst of slavery. I come from a long line of ministers and preachers, men and women of God. And that is what really kept our family together. And in these photos, you will see, in 1987, we attended a family reunion. And that was the start of us collecting information from our elder in the family at that reunion to start our family research. And we've been doing that ever since we're cousins across the country. The community that my family grew up in was a village. They took care of the children in that village. And when my parents got married in her parents' yard in Anadarka, Texas, they left there and went to Borga, Texas. And Borga was a strong community as well. The church was always in the lead in the community. And at six months old, my parents moved me and my sister to Amarillo, Texas. And my third sister was born in Amarillo. Amarillo was a strong community. And the churches, again, were in the lead in the community. My father was a pastor for 36 years. And I can remember my father being in three-piece suits with his fellow ministers. And they'd go downtown and bail people out of jail. They were very much the head of the community. Our community had teen swings that on weekends. And they would end at midnight. And we walked home without fear because our village took care of us. I can remember the bookmobile coming to my home. And it was not until years later that I realized we could not go to the library, which is why the bookmobile came to our neighborhood. But our families, our communities fought for us to have those bookmobiles so we could have the same things that other people had. And my family was strong. Our community was strong. Nobody was hungry in our communities. And when I go back to Monte Verde, in 2018, the state of Texas erected a, a monument that really honored those enslaved on the Monte Verde plantation. And it was the first time those enslaved were honored with a, with a monument. And my family's names, Spencer and Ball, are on that monument. This is the school where my parents grew up. They grew up in a Rosenwald school that was built in 1925 and 26, but it started in 1868 when they started the church in Anadarka. We had a strong family community. My parents had a strong family community. The black community has been the moral base for strength in this country, and we continue to do that. So I say to you, as Dr. Woodson said, Christianity in this country we know what Christianity is. The Negro was a Christian himself, and he did not doubt the power of the principles enunciated by Jesus Christ. But the religion that was practiced at that time, he doubted if there was actual Christianity that ever existed in Europe. And he said if it did, it died an untimely death on his trip across the Atlantic. So today, the church must be strong, as it was during my time. It's time for us to take the lead again in order to save this country. And what will save this country is the truth. The enemy is not the individual who has oppressed him, but the evil system which has permitted the individual to do so. So let's crush that system that still exists today by educating all about the truth of our history. And I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Barbara. Very enriching. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have questions, and I think I'm going to start with Karen, because I have an affinity for Washington, D.C. and Howard University. And I would like for you to discuss about the Empire Laundry business. As an MD and OBGYN, for your father to have opened a business to be parallel to that, what did that do for your family in terms of wealth or notoriety in the community? Well, it changed my family uh, because his brothers, his younger brothers, were still in Pennsylvania and they weren't able to complete college. And my father did not want them to have to work a menial job and work for white men. And so he had the means to be able to, uh, he was able to obtain a loan from Industrial Bank of Washington. 
and to create the laundry service. And one of his patients had complained to him about how the, there wasn't really a good diaper service in D.C. And he knew there was a need there as well as Howard University was one of his, uh, one of their main clients as well in the linen service. So he created that uh, business because he did not want his family to be dependent on working for white people. Thank you. And that would lead me back to Allison in terms of how her mother, talking about Molly Church and her mother, how important was Louise Ayers Church to Terrell in her personal life and in her own issue with motherhood, as you describe in your book, about various medical health issues? Yeah, um, Louisa Ayers Church was an independent business owner, and she was able to set up um, a hair shop that sold hair extensions and wigs for uh, elite white women in the era in Memphis, Tennessee, after the Civil War. And from what we can gather, her white father, who was also her enslaver, seems to have either given her a loan or money to start the business. But she was able to leverage that to buy the first church family home and their first carriage. And so this was at a time when Robert Church was having his own series of troubles because he had uh, challenged the uh, basically the black codes and tried to open up his own business. And so uh, it, Molly Church Terrell always looked up to her mother as someone who was an independent businesswoman. Thank you. We have a question from the audience, which I'd like to pose to both Darius and Barbara. And I'm going to start with you first, Darius. The question was, how do the stories of the persons that you're talking about compare to those not as advantaged to have left documentary evidence or photographic evidence? How do you view that in terms of scholarship and how you capture stories? Um, well, I'll, I'll kind of talk about just my introduction to church. I Actually, um, I was a student at University of Memphis, and I planned to write about uh, race violence and lynching. And I, in my first uh, research seminar, I started to, I wrote about um, the lynching of L persons in 1917. And from there, I really um, saw how close um, politics were to understanding race violence in the South. And um, I came across this guy, Robert Church Jr. And when I was there, um, the, the collection, from what I understand, had recently been open, right? So I was in a very advantaged position. Allison probably has seen the collection as well, where, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of boxes and papers um, uh, from Church uh, Senior, from Junior, from uh, Roberta, right, and, and the entire family. And from that, uh, you think about, really, what stories do you want to tell? For me, it was Black politics. But um, I wanted to use church and place him into the conversation of black leadership and uh, really develop a narrative that intertwined those two. Where we're talking about him as this black political leader who's close with James Weldon Johnson and interacting with W.B. Du Bois and all these titans when we think about the black freedom struggle. But also um, to talk about the people and... Uh, organizing the black vote and him really teaching and, and, and talking uh, to folks not only in Tennessee but throughout the United States uh, about the importance of that. And, you know, I was just able and really lucky to be able to do that with the access that I had to that collection. And I hope I, hope I accomplished that in, in the book as well. So, Barbara, can you also answer a question similar along the lines of how does the stories that you're talking about compare or how would someone who has less documentary evidence tell their story or be included in that narrative of American history? That's a very good question, Ida, because my family was very surprised when in 2010 we found out about a book that was written by Dorman Winfrey. He did his PhD at the University of Texas, and these records were left by the slave owner to the University of Texas. We would not have known all the information we know. What I am really asking people to do, and which is why I really addressed the brutal root of slavery, we have to come together as the human family. 
because most of our records, we have to get to the rest of our records by connecting with the white families that enslaved us. And if we don't do that, all we will know is what we get from our family history, the oral history, and through our DNA connections. I am connected with cousins who have found me, a cousin in England who found us through DNA. But I have a cousin that is really working hard because he found his cousins through DNA. He is working hard to help other people find their relatives through DNA. So we have to really come to a reconciliation in this country because we're not going to get to the end if we don't come together as the human family. Thank you. And that's a perfect segue to, to uh, John. I would like to know how your mother's career as a librarian really facilitated your career as well as your father's kind of person in the stacks to be of assistance to him. Well, you know that uh, to avoid rape, black fathers sent their daughters, if they could, to college before they'd send their sons to college. So my grandmother and her sister went to Livingston. They're daughters of an AME Zion bishop. So they go to Livingston College in Salisbury, North Carolina at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And they graduated in 1903 and 1904, respectively. So my mother grows up in, an high school, in a household with college graduates. Her father and mother are college graduates. She and my father become uh, freshman sweethearts through college. And uh, she decides to go straight from Fisk in 1935 to Hampton. And I asked my parents about when did they first come to Washington? When did they first come to the Library of Congress? And my mother comes in her first year at Hampton to Washington with her class to visit the National Archives and the Library of Congress. And she's committed to being a librarian by that time. And so her first job uh, in Goldsboro as an English teacher but when she and my father marry, she then goes to a series of librarian positions uh, in Raleigh, in uh, Durham, as I said, at North Carolina Central, law, law, as the law librarian at North Carolina Central. And then when she comes here to D.C., um, she has the same experience that my father's mother had. She's working for the Prince George's County School System as a librarian but she doesn't have sufficient tenure in the system. And the superintendent, and Karen and I found this letter in my mother's meticulous files at the Duke Library. The superintendent denies her maternity leave. And so she leaves the Prince George's County system, takes care, has me, and then as soon as she's able, joins the public library system in Washington and is the first librarian at Spingarn when it opens. Then she, like Karen's mother, when we come on the scene and are living in predominantly white and hostile neighborhoods, they stop working to usher us through elementary school so that when we come home, if a, if a crisis calling us whatever at school, they're home to support us before the, before our fathers get home. Uh, so after I leave the nest, at least after I leave elementary school, she then begins to be involved, sometimes as a librarian at children's hospitals, but she becomes deeply involved in Illinois Family and Child Services. And she's on the board of Illinois F Child Services. And so she's concerned with children and their welfare. She's also very concerned, uh, and her sister becomes a librarian, and Karen's mother at one point also is a librarian. She becomes concerned with the dearth of materials on for African-American children, because children's books published in the United States are primarily at that time for white children. So there's a movement among black librarians to make sure that their children's books written for and geared to and available to black children in libraries. That's a very fitting question. I would like to ask both Allison and Darius to talk about this relationship of books for children. It's my understanding in reading Darius's work that Molly would send her brother books 
and kind of encourage his literacy as a young person and give him a global perspective. So if Darius and Allison kind of talk about the filial relationship between sister and brother, almost could have been his mother because of her age difference with him. What did that mean in terms of the sense of, the sense of agency and the sense of responsibility to community? Right. Um, in many ways, church uh, follows Molly's footsteps in terms of going to Oberlin and, and things of that nature. But yeah, when she was studying in German, in German uh, Germany, she would send him uh, these coloring books and other children's books uh, that were written in German. She would sign, um, you know, her her letters in, in using German language. And the kicker to that was. Church was like three, right? He was just this kid. <laughs> um, but that was very much his introduction. And I mean, it gives you a lens into what education meant to that family. And she challenged him as a three-year-old, four-year-old in those letters uh, to constantly read and to, to, to learn other languages and to really be abreast of the issues of his day as a, as a toddler. And so she has this very profound impact on him not only in terms of his pursuit of education, but even as he's trying to come into his own and he's um, trying to emerge on the political scene, you know, he um, is very much a, a victim of his day in some of his early work when he first comes back home from college. And, um, you know, evidently he was espousing ideas about women should not have the right to vote. But his big sister is Molly Church, Mary Church Terrell, right? And so, I mean, she wrote this four-page letter. She said, entitled, you know, it, it starts off, my dear, sweet little brother. And that was the nicest thing about that letter. <laughs> from there, she just let him have it. Uh, but from there, as he develops the Lincoln League, Mary plays a role, Ida B. Wells plays a role. All the church women are registered to vote, help start the NAACP. So she really shaped and molded him as a political activist. Um, and I think she may have been one of his largest influences in terms of his political activism um, as he matured into, into an activist of his own right. Yeah, thank you for those stories. That's really wonderful. Um, it is true that she was very uh, smart and um, a really precocious child. And so her parents both thought that she needed to leave Memphis, which at the time only had a very, very inadequate um, so-called colored school um, that they didn't think that she would thrive in. And she was um, from early on reading children's magazines and entering little contests and um, very, very interested in, in things having to do with writing. And even though she became a, uh, a speech writer and a journalist, she always had hopes to be a fiction writer, which she didn't really entirely achieve. Um, so that was something that she regretted. But she did um, really, it mattered to her that her father had not been emancipated in 1851. Church Sr. Uh, actually didn't really know how to write. He, he could read, but he had somebody, often Anna, uh, right, church, his second or technically actually his third wife, because yeah. he was married um, much earlier uh, during the period of slavery before Louisa. But um, in any event, the, the, the real uh, issue for her is that he was not fully literate and uh, she was so proud of what he achieved, but it bothered and upset her that he had never had that opportunity because he was so brilliant. And uh, she also her mother was um, taught French by her young mistress, who was also her sister. And so she learned some French, but she also was kind of barely literate in terms of her ability um, in some ways to write. So it was a strange mixture of being able to speak French, but not. And so it was Louisa who paid for her German lessons when she was in elementary school because her mother wanted her to truly be literate in, and fluent in multiple languages. And she ended up being fluent in five. So um, her mother's goals were reached. So. Thank you. And I'd like to ask John and Karen to kind of chime in about the idea of how do you steward a legacy of expectation from uh, an educated elite background? What is the intentions or is there an intention or is there a responsibility to race awareness such as your great grandparents or grandparents might have had? Do you feel some kind of compunction in the contemporary to kind of continue to hold that torch? 
in that regard. John, why don't you start first? Okay, well, this being... Unmute, Mr. Oh, there you go. This being the centennial of the Tulsa Race Massacre, I've been deeply involved and concerned with the way that story is told. You remember that the Tulsa massacre was story was suppressed for decades. And some white journalists trying to do research about it in the 70s received death threats. Because the children of the people who destroyed our community, who looted our homes, burned the homes, bombed them from the air, were still running Tulsa. And when you read Tulsa's history, by 1925, no white person is talking about the destruction of Little Africa, as they called it. And when I took a delegation to Switzerland from Tulsa, of people who should have known each other but didn't know each other, and we showed the silent footage of the smoldering black community, the international audience assumed it was World War Europe after World War II. I said, no, no, that's the result of white supremacy in the United States in 1921. And when a country like ours made practically no recognition of the centennial of the Red Summer of 1919, we realized that we must tell the history of 1921. And after January 6th, I remembered my grandfather's words about being in a white mom. And I've read those words in various talks. So we have a responsibility to let, make sure that people do not forget. We are a country that loves to forget. And as my father called it, likes happy history. So we are forced to bring this to the attention of white Tulsans. I accuse white Tulsans to a great extent of being Holocaust deniers. And I found it very interesting uh, that as we approach the actual centennial in May and are planning for the 12th annual John Hope Franklin Reconciliation in America Symposium, that one of the groups that reached out to us is an African-American Jewish theological group out of Chicago who are watching this history, want to come and witness the centennial. And uh, one of the leaders of the group drew my attention to the fact that the Yiddish press, June 1st, June 2nd, 1921, talks about Tulsa in the exact terms of pogrom that they use to describe the pogroms in Europe. And they will be doing a panel at the symposium looking at the chronicling of attacks on black communities in the Yiddish press and Yiddish literature. So they knew about it in, in London, they knew about it in New York, but the people in Tulsa growing up, black and white, have basically not known that history. So part of the centennial purpose is to make sure that every child learns this history and every adult learns this history. I think that it's important for us to document our family's histories. And that's what John and I both plan to write about our lives as well as I want to write about my mother and father. I think that's most important while we were able to. And we have such rich images as well as documentation. We also have found both, John and I both have found that um, while growing up, a lot of people, not just um, whites, but a lot of people are not aware that African Americans, that my grand, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother and grandfather, both were college graduates from Benedict College. My mother was a graduate from Benedict College, and my father came to Howard and you know achieved, received his medical degree. And most people, most particularly whites, are not. They can't believe that. I was at a attended a reception with John and his father. Um, I don't recall what year, but it was probably in the early, maybe 2003, 2004. And a lady told me that I couldn't, wasn't possible that my grandfather, 
had graduated from college. She asked me, what year was he born? And I told her, and she looked at me in absolute amazement like I was lying. She just said, didn't think that was possible because she couldn't imagine that because of most whites did not graduate from college in the early 1900s. More than 19, you know, 19, early 1900s, or when my father graduated from um, college in 1931, my mother graduated in 1935. So I just think it's very important to educate everyone about our legacies. Thank you. As we get ready to close, I'd like to give you all just a brief moment to think and how you're going to phrase this in about two minutes. I am the timekeeper. Is to think about what does the legacy of the black family, representation, identity, and diversity mean to you in terms of the lay community, those who are simply just passing by, and in terms of our young people, the millennials? What does that mean to them? And then thirdly, to those individuals who might not know that their family did something or don't feel their family, quote, accomplished anything, because there's no documentary evidence, there's no wealth of photographs or oral tradition or even geographic stability. So how would you speak to either one of those communities or all three of those communities in terms of what does the black family's representation, identity, and diversity look like from a millennial perspective, uh, a layperson's perspective, or someone who does not feel that their story warrants research? And I will start with Ms. Dunn. Ida. Thank you, Ida. Um, I, that is a really good question because the first thing I think that the millennial community needs to understand is how important history is, how important knowing the past in order to understand what your present is. And as we work together with an intergenerational flow of information, what we have to do now is correct what's happening in our school systems. That's one of the reasons why I'm very excited about BH 365 because this textbook is really an interactive textbook that reaches the millennials in a huge way. Not only do they have the truth and they start in Africa, they also have music that goes along, 41 songs that go with the units in the chapter. And what I've found from the young people that are engaged in this book they are really blown away with the information that they do not know. And so for the lay community, for the millennials, even for the elders who got through life and still didn't get the truth, I think all we need to do now is tell the truth. It's documented. And Dr. Woodson's work made sure it was. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History, who is the reason why we celebrate Af Black History Month every year, the documentation is there for us to get. So I tell everybody, start today doing your own self-study. Don't wait for people. Don't wait for us to fix the school system, which we are working on. But let's all come together and start a plan to learn what the truth about the history is. That would really solve the problem that John is having with the 1921 Tulsa massacre and everything else. Because we have to tell the truth, and the truth does exist. Thank you. I'd like to Allison next, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think that uh, we really can communicate this idea that everyone has a history and everyone's history matters. And telling the stories of prominent Blacks and elites who went to college and did all of these things is fantastic, but it's not the end of it. And I, I do think that saving records, even you know, if it's emails, um, that people can be come aware of the fact that their stories and lives matter. And I think that oral histories do have a role to play in this because most families know something about their family histories and um, the projects that have you interview your oldest relatives and uh, the story core type of ideas, you know, that that's a really accessible thing. You can do it on a phone. And a lot of people do have phones these days who can record a, a conversation. So it's really encouraging people to do that and to work with the libraries and archives to think about whether it's possible to save some of their family's documents in a way that feels meaningful to them with the full cooperation of the families, um, rather than feeling like their papers are being taken away. And one thing we did with Terrell's uh, family when they 
donated um, a portion of their the last papers that they had to o Oberlin College is we also made sure they had copies of every single thing that they gave in multiple forms so that they could access it anytime they wanted and didn't feel like they were losing that family history when they gave those last papers to Oberlin recently. Okay, Karen, I'd like to go to you next if you don't Well, I agree with Allison. I believe it's important for um, the younger people to interview their, start off with interviewing their elders, even if they do not have any papers or they don't have um, a collection of photos, they can still start off with talking with their elders and getting to know their elders and finding out what their story is. And I agree that everyone has a rich history. It doesn't have to be where you have to be a college graduate to in order to have had a rich life. But you certainly uh, could start off with interviewing your elders. And give, most people don't take the time, or when they, when they do, they wish they had. There's so many things I would have liked to have asked my parents that I did not. And you will find that, to be, that you're unable to do so. So I would start there. And then to educate our children. I really don't think that they know their full history. And that's what's so important. And I think if they knew their rich history, they would know that they are playing an important role in the society. Thank you. I'm going to go to Darius next. I'm saving you for last, John. All right. So real quick, um, again, I, I agree with, with everything the panelists uh, said before me. The first thing I wrote down was to have conversations uh, with the elders in your family. But also when you think about the theme that Asala has um, came up with this year, it forces us to think about family outside of just the context of uh, these blood bonds and to think about it in terms of community and kinship and that um, some of us may not have access to our elders anymore in our own personal families, but if we think about family from a community perspective and understand that all of our stories, whether we're from uh, the elite fa families like uh, Mrs. Franklin just said or um, from working class families, whatever, that all of those stories are important, vital, and are all uh, interconnected. And I think that's what we're trying to do ultimately with our work is to not separate and divide uh, the elite from the masses or so on and so forth, but to really talk about the collective black experience and how rich and diverse it is. So to think about family from a community perspective and to uh, be interested in learning and telling those stories um, as we move forward, so. John. Thank you, Ida. It's been a great discussion. I've enjoyed being with all of the panelists. My father said that everyone's life is important and everyone's life story is worthy of a book. Regardless of where you are in the social hierarchy, we're such a stratified society that we must realize that we actually have family members of different social classes, and we value them, whether they are as aunts, uncles, children, you know, cousins. So within our families, we have a range of experience, uh, and we need to know not just the experience of our elders, but if you have two, three generations, children need to know about their parents and their cousins' lives. Um, if you have the opportunity now with telephones and we can talk to each other across the country. We don't actually have to physically be in the same city to learn from each other. So in the museum community, as echoing my fellow panelists, we encourage young people to learn the skill of interviewing. And once you interview someone you know and realize that they are a repository of knowledge of all kinds of things that you haven't experienced, then you can take that skill and ask your neighbors and then you can even ask people you don't yet know about their lives. So you can delve into the richness of the human experience and then share those experiences with other people. That's what makes us able to understand one another. But I do have to put in a point, we've been, this has sort of been a binary black and white community discussion. Right now, those of us who consider ourselves freedmen, the descendants of enslaved people enslaved by American Indians are battling with the tribes 
who want to deny they enslaved us. And this is current law. Yesterday, the Cherokee Supreme Court announced that they were no longer considering relations by blood so that people who were enslaved by them have rights to citizenship in the tribe. And if you go through the court system now, you know, there's a recent Supreme Court case dealing with the eastern half of, of Oklahoma. So these are issues between Native and African-American people that have yet to be resolved. And we are being denied citizenship and access to our rights as citizens of those five alleged civilized tribes. I'll get off my soapbox. It's a lovely soapbox, and I thank you so very much. Of course, like I said, this is going to be a cursory conversation, and I want to thank my panelists, Allison, Darius, Karen, John, and Barbara, for a lovely conversation from the vantage point of the Black family, di representation, identity, and diversity. I would also like to thank the National Archives Foundation and a generous support from the Ford Motor Co Company Fund for their sponsorship of this program. I would also like to thank the partnership with Association for the Study of African American Life and History. As you heard, ASALH, the association, or ASALA mentioned throughout all of this, please do visit us at asalh.org. We'll be having a conference in September. We'll be going into greater, deeper dives with a national and international audience on the Black history theme, the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. I'd be remiss if I did not thank Susan Clifton, of NARA and the NARA IT community that have been very supportive of making this sound seamless and making me a temporary uh, engineer clicking buttons. And I'd also be remiss if I did not thank Dr. Betty Gardner and Barbara Dunn for their planning and strategizing this co collective conversation with our panelists. Once again, thank you so very much. Please support our sponsors. And like our panels have said, start to investigate with the self going outwards into your community. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. <laughs>